Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we will talk about lasers. So, about what kind of device this is, how it was made, etc. Well, obviously not in all details because uh, it's kind of complicated issue. Um, a few physicists uh, have received a Nobel Prize for basically making this particular um, device. Uh, however, certain general ideas about what's inside we will talk about. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. I suggest you to go to this website, Unizor.com, to, to watch this lecture. Um, if you found it somewhere else, you will have only this particular lecture, video, let's say on YouTube. Um, the website contains the whole course, which means there is a menu logically related to each other, uh, different parts of the course, chapters, and individual lectures. Every lecture on the website has textual um, explanation, which basically is like a textbook, piece of a textbook for that particular lecture. Um, there are exams, um, and there are certain other functionalities which you might find um, very helpful over there. And some other courses, like for instance, there is a prerequisite course, Mass for Teens. You can't do physics without mass. So basically that's one of the important components of the website, plus something else. Uh, and the website is completely free. There are no advertisement, no financial strings attached. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Um, and uh, there are certain pieces of functionalities that sign, which require sign-in. Like, for instance, you would like to do a supervised study with your parents or teachers or something else. Back to lasers. Well, you, I'm, I'm sure you know uh, a lot about lasers. I mean, you've seen lasers, like, for instance, um, in, in the supermarket you see the scanners, the price scanners. Uh, there are pointers, like a small little tube, and it points like green or, s or a red light very, very far away. Um, laser printers, um, there are some um, developments in the m uh, military industry, like a weapon, laser as a weapon, to, to hit the drone, for instance, if it's not far away. Uh, so, there are many different applications which you might or might not be familiar with it. And obviously everybody knows that lasers are the favorite weapon in all the science fiction movies, starting from the Star Wars. Um, so, we will talk about uh, lasers in this lecture. And again, it's not about all the technical details, but rather about ideas which are at the foundation of uh, of this device. Now, let's start with something which you might be familiar with uh, from other lectures of this course. <coughs> I'll just remind it to you. So, the first thing which I would like to talk about is structure of the atom and how photons and um, electrons uh, are um, acting with each other. There is a special lecture about this, but if you did not watch that lecture, I'll just very, very briefly um, repeat it. So, the contemporary um, view onto atom is that, first of all, there is obviously a nucleus which contains protons and neutrons, and there are electrons which are around it. Um, number of electrons is equal to number of protons. That's the atomic number of every element. Uh, like hydrogen has atomic element one. There is one proton and one electron. The number of neutrons can be different, but anyway. Um, helium is two, so there are two protons, two uh, electrons. Now, in case of um, hydrogen and helium, uh, one or correspondingly two electrons are uh, on the same um, orbit around the um, atom, the first one, the first orbit. Um, now, what's very important, and this is the contemporary view on the structure of the atom, that every element has more than one orbit. 
uh, and there is certain maximum number of electrons per orbit. For instance, there is two on the first layer, uh, eight on the second layer as a maximum. 18 on the third one, etc. And different elements have different elements of dif different number of electrons in different layers. Now, every layer has certain number of electrons for, for, for whatever element we are talking about. And all the ele electrons on the same uh, orbit uh, or the same shell as we are now more appropriately I think call it because we're talking about three-dimensional things so it's a shell basically so all electrons in the same shell whether it's the first shell or the second shell etc they share exactly the same amount of energy because they are on the same distance from the nucleus so the same forces between nucleus and electrons are working and keep them on this on this shell so all electrons on any particular shell of any element have the same energy. Now, what's very important is that for each element the radiuses of these shells, and you can consider them as concentric spheres, just as a model. So the radiuses cannot take any, no any value. There are specific um, distinct value for every element. So this is, let's say, the radius and what's important energy level of the first shell around the nucleus. This is uh, an energy level for the second, uh, the third, etc., etc. So again, every element has distinct um, uh, values for energies on every shell. Now, can this electron jump to the uh, shell which is uh, on, on a further distance from the, uh, from the uh, nucleus? Yes, it can. But this shell has a different energy level. So just by itself, it's unlikely that it, it will jump there. We need certain push. So, if there is certain exchange of energy, and in particular case radiation, electromagnetic oscillation, between something from outside and electrons, these can actually give a push to the electron to jump from one shell to another. Now, there are certain positions of electrons which we call stable or ground positions or ground level of energy. Now this is the stable element. If a particular electron jumps from a shell where it's stable, where it's supposed to be, so to speak, in a neutral environment without any kind of interaction with outside energy. So if it jumps to a different shell, let's say we supply some energy and push it to the outside. Well, energy is supposed to be conserved, right? So if this particular electron is pushed, there is certain uh, 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 conservation of, of energy law which says that it will supposed to have more energy, excited uh, as we speak uh, right now. So it moves to a higher orbit, a higher shell from the um, nucleus. Now, by the way, the potential energy is negative of all these electrons and we talked about the reason why. So when it moves further, it decreases the absolute value of this potential energy. But since it's negative, it's an increase. It's closer to zero. And where is zero? Zero is on infinity. Infinity is zero potential energy. And the closer we are, uh, since this is positive and this is negative, it's the field itself which pulls it. It's not we who spend energy. So that's why the potential energy is considered to be negative. We don't spend energy. The field actually attracts it. So it decreases absolute value, uh, but since it's negative, it's increasing the potential energy. Um, and it, it, it's possible only if we supply certain amount of positive energy 
to this, and since the energy is supposed to be conserved, whatever it has right now, plus our positive, will give it a less negative, so to speak. But that's an increase in, 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 in energy of this particular electron. Now, when it moves to another orbit, to another shell, the whole, uh, uh, this electron becomes less stable. And it has a tendency to jump down by itself, or maybe with certain push from outside, again, some energy uh, may be uh, uh, supplied. But in any case, when it just by itself, let's consider by itself, when it goes from this level, more energetic level, to this level, which is less energetic, the piece of energy is supposed to be going somewhere. So that's usually electromagnetic oscillation. It's a quant quantum of energy, which we call photon. So whenever the electron jumps from here to here, it actually gives away a certain amount of energy as a photon. Well, it can be any kind of electromagnetic um, uh, oscillation. It can be in the, in the visible spectrum, and then you will see the light. Okay, so this is basically a preamble about how the atom is structured and how it interacts with energy. Question is, can we use it to create something like laser? Laser. Well, by the way, laser is an abbreviation. It's a light amplification uh, by stimulating emission radiation. Emission radiation. Emission radiation is basically the light which goes out. But we have to amplify it somehow. To have something like a Star Wars laser guns, you need to amplify this. So that's why it's a light amplification. Now, what S it stands for, it's a stimulating. So, by itself, whenever, let's say, we are supplying some electric energy uh, to the gas, and I will talk about particular kind of lasers um, which are based on the gas, uh, like helium and neon, for instance, mixture. If you put two electrodes, then um, the gas, uh, at certain moment, if the voltage is sufficient, and the voltage is supposed to be really sufficient, because the gas, generally speaking, is, 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 iso is, is isolating uh, substance, but if sufficient amount of energy supplied, high voltage, then the electrons will move from cathode to anode. And uh, meanwhile, they will hit electrons of the gas itself and excite them. They will bump to another level. After a while, when this other level becomes overpopulated, um, it will jump down by itself because it cannot really hold anymore so much energy. And the whole gas becomes actually like emitting certain light. This is not the, the laser, but light will be emitted because the energy which is supplied through, this, through these two uh, uh, electrodes which are going into the gas. And since the energy is actually supplied to the whole gas, which means into electrons of, these, of the atoms, it should go somewhere. It cannot infinitely consume this amount of energy, basically doing nothing. Because, yes, uh, after a certain amount of time, accumulated on the outer shells electrons in a non-stable condition will start jumping back and emitting light. And that's how it goes. All right. However, as I said, this is not a laser yet because it's not like a one coherent uh, ray of light. Coherent means it's the same um, um, frequency or the wavelengths and the same phase. That's what makes it amplification. Uh, that's what make ampl uh, makes amplification. You have to really have all these um, rays of light emitted by all the electrons to have the same phase and the same frequency, only then they will increase each other. So if you have one 
uh, oscillation and another oscillation exactly the same, then the result will be the oscillation of higher amplitude. So that's what makes make it strong makes it stronger. So question is how to to do how to do this type of synchronization between electrons jumping from here to here. That's what's very important. And here comes the idea. Here is the idea. How to stimulate and what happens if you do, how to stimulate electron jumping um, on our command, not by itself, God knows when and God knows how, but on our command, how to make it jump from here to here and emit light of a specific frequency and specific phase. And here is the idea. Again, this is idea, it's not implementation yet. Let's say you have supplied a certain amount of energy and this electron jumps to a higher uh, energy shell. It's less stable, but it's still there. And then another one and another, etc. Now, what happens if there is one particular photon which hits this particular electron and amount of energy which is carried by this photon is exactly equal to the amount of energy uh, which is difference between the ground level, the normal, the stable level where this electron lives and the energy where it is right now on a higher level shell. So what happens? That's very interesting and there were a lot of experiments actually about it. What happens is the following. This becomes even more excited and it does not really consume this energy of uh, el energy which is carried by, by, by this photon. No, it actually forces this particular um, electron to jump back to whatever um, it, it, its place, its uh, ground uh, shell is the stable and since it emits certain amount of um, uh, energy its energy will be from the higher to the lower level right so it's supposed to emit certain amount of energy but it does not consume this one this is just like um, in certain chemical reaction you have to add something to force this chemical reaction but it's not really participating in this chemical reaction. Same thing here. This photon is just giving it a, a stimulus. That's what stimulating S is. It gives a stimulus to jump back. But then it just goes away further. So, I don't know. You can say that if it's two balls, for example, and this ball hits it at some angle, well, this will continue working, uh, moving further, and this one will go this way, right? So, what this particular thing does is exactly the same. So this photon goes further, but since it moves this electron, or it stimulates this electron to move from higher uh, energy level to lower energy level, and it actually emits certain amount of energy as radiation, as a photon, as electromagnetic oscillation, it actually emits the second photon. So now we have two photons. And what's very important is, and again, that was kind of experimentally uh, discovered, proved, I don't know how to say it, that these two photons have exactly the same frequency and phase. Now, the fact that they have exactly the same frequency is obvious because as you remember, the amount of energy which is photon is Planck constant times frequency. This is a quant of energy. This is a photon. It depends only on frequency. And as I said, the amount of energy this photon carries, which means its frequency, is exactly the same as amount of energy between these two um, uh, shells, 
which means that the amount of energy of this photon, which is emitted when the electron moves uh, down, down the orbit, again is the same as the amount of energy here, which means its frequency is exactly the same, because frequency and amount of energy are related only by a factor, Planck's constant. So these are have exactly the same frequency. That's obvious by design, because again we have stimulated with this particular uh, amount of energy carried by this photon. About phase, well, I don't know. Maybe it just happens. I don't know why it happens, but maybe there are certain theoretical foundation why the phase of this particular photon. Uh, emitted by the electron is exactly the same as incident photon. But whatever it is, it is. It's the same phase. Now we have two photons. So what happens? From one photon, we have two now. What do we need for this? All we need is one excited electron. And we have to make sure that the energy of this photon corresponds to the difference between energy levels of these two shells. Okay, great. So this is idea. How can we amplify, so to speak? Because these two photons will meet another atom. Will meet another atom. And it has two electrons on a higher, on a non-stable uh, energy level. Each one of them will be exactly the same as this one. So this one will produce two, and this one will produce two. Now we have four. So we have a chain reaction, actually. This is a chain reaction, and we can maintain this chain reaction if number of electrons on the outer orbits, the high energy orbits, will be supplied constantly. And we can do it if, for instance, if this is a gas, and we have two electrons with high voltage, it's constantly moving electrons to higher orbits. Because energy is supposed to be electric energy, which we are supplying from the battery, will be converted into excited electrons. So we'll have a, a, a flow of high energy electrons. Okay, great. Now, these photons, let's say we just hit one photon, but one photon will produce two and two produce four etc so we will have a chain reaction and that's how all the energy supplied by the batteries will be converted into light the number of photons will be greater and greater and what's important that all of them will repeat exactly what this particular photon has the frequency and phase and that's what makes it actually already this idea kind of closer. Now my question is only how to direct all these photons to the same place because they are all emphasize each other, they amplify each other and they are the same frequency, the same phase, so that would be a blast, so to speak, right? And now the last part of this lecture is a very, very primitive uh, schematic description of how this might, for instance, work in case of gas as a medium. As I was saying, something like helium and neon mix um, is used in certain lasers, and what they do, they put it, let's say, in a tube, um, they put a reflector here, and they put a partial reflector here. Now, what is reflector and partial reflector? Reflector reflects all the light. Partial reflector uh, reflects only the uh, weak light. But the strong light will break through. Now, if you have two electrodes here connected to a battery, and this is the gas, so with high voltage, it becomes actually um, a conductor, and uh, the electric um, current would be established between these two electrodes and as it goes it excites all the electrons here and now all we need is this 
Well, we don't really have to really, we don't have to have it as externally supplied in this particular case, because every once in a while electrons are just jumping down by themselves, and they emit exactly the uh, photon. Let's start with one photon. So we don't have external photon. We have one spontaneously emitted photon when this electron jumps here. And this one spontaneous now stimulates already two, four, etc. So that's how we have the whole avalanche of photons. But now, how do they move? Well, those who are moving randomly in these directions are basically disappear. Or maybe we can put some reflection, reflection here as well. But those who move here will be reflected here. And while it's still weak signal, it will be reflected back. So all these photons which are going along this direction will amplify each other greater and greater until they will break through. Now, again, this is extremely primitive picture of how the lasers, gas lasers, are uh, arranged, but nevertheless looks like it works. There are uh, lasers based on solid body medium, like ruby, for example. There are liquid-based lasers. There are many kind of uh, lasers by now, um, but initially the whole idea, and that's exactly what I wanted to talk about today, the idea of the laser, that hit by, an, uh, by a photon of a specific um, energy, which corresponds to the energy needed for this particular electron to jump from a uh, higher orbit to a lower orbit, will generate the chain reaction. And now we just force these photons, which are exactly of the same frequency and, 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 and phase to go to our direction and amplify each other. Well, that's basically it about lasers. Um, read the, cont uh, the, the, the notes for this particular lecture. Uh, it, it might actually you know, be a little bit better explained even. I was trying to be very, very specific in these notes. And there are a couple of pictures much better than these ones. Well, that's it. <coughs> Other than that, Thank you very much and good luck.